Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. We have a special guest today, but before that, a few comments. As, as usual, I bring up some um, information about people who have changed the way we think about biology or medicine or healthcare, uh, just to keep us um, aware that uh, what we do today has been based on the hard work and efforts and sacrifices of many people throughout history. So I'm gonna bring you as far back as 1541. 1541 was the death of Philippus Aurelius Paracelsus, and it's early in the morning, I still have my Spanish on me. He was not born with that name. He was born Theophrastus Philippus Aurelius Bombastus von Hohenheim. Should I repeat that? Thank you, thank you. He was a German Swiss physician an alchemist who condemned medical teaching that was not based on observation or experience. He was also one of the first to establish chemistry in medicine. He introduced chemical remedies and replacing herbal ones. Uh, Paracelsus saw illness as having a specific external cause rather than alterations in the or imbalance of the body humors, which was the main theme of the day. Um, he also felt that mental illness was not related to demons, but that there must have been causes in the environment causing this. And in fact, he linked goiter with minerals in the drinking water. This is in the early 1500s, and he published a book called Great Surgery Book of 1936, where he discussed a number of issues. But his views were so controversial, this is a pointer for us, that he got exiled in 1538, okay? On 1855, on this day, Claude Bernard, who was a French physiologist, spoke to the Academy of Sciences and he described how he discovered glycogen in the liver. On this day, on this day. On this day was the birth in 1895 of André Cornard, or Cornard, who was a French-American physiologist and together with uh, two others won the Nobel Prize in eight, 1956 for heart catheterization. Okay, and finally, Severo Ochoa. How could we forget Severo Ochoa? Spanish-American biochemist. He won the Nobel Prize in 1956 with Arthur Kornberg for his discovery of RNA polymerase and the synthesis of RNA. And with that, I'll leave you with Chris Kruger, the chief of GI, who's going to present our distinguished guests. Good morning. I had to carry uh, Dr. Hughes' CV up here it's so distinguished as an assistant professor. Let me tell you a little bit about Mike and then why he's here today. Um, he hails from Annapolis, Maryland, and was an English major at Wake Forest. I think that's how he learned how to write grants, and he's very articulate. Uh, he did his fellowship training and oh, intern and residency at UVA, and then fellowship uh, training at Wake Forest. Now, his uh, entire period of training was about nine years, so that's about twice as long as medicine residents even going into uh, their specialty trainings. And But it shows he received a research award by the NIH as a medical student. He also received NIH funding during his fellowship. He had received numerous awards throughout his training, and he learned not only to be a scientist but a clinician and a good teacher. So as an assistant professor, he's already had over 100 publications and presentations. Um, he's obviously a member of uh, societies such as AOA, and uh, he's, just, he's just a very humble person. He's sitting here just mad at me now because he's incredibly nice and humble, which is uh, very refreshing. So what what Mike does for GI doctors, I mean, you think of GI doctors, we usually call upon the surgeons when we put holes places we weren't supposed to. Well, this has really changed. I mean, we do interdepartmental collaborations now throughout our training. This is really the forefront of translational research. We call upon the surgeons when we can't treat Crohn's disease, when we can't adequately take care of complicated diverticulosis, achalasia, and as uh, Jesse and Mike, uh, Mike were talking ahead of time, his main role now is to help with gastric stimulator placement, and they put in over 300 pacemakers a year in our patients with diabetic and idiopathic gastroparesis. So uh, with that, I'm gonna give you a sneak preview that next week there will be a press conference uh, starring uh, Dr. Michael Hughes. Uh, you'll have uh, David Dunn there and Joe Jeline, and they will officially kick off 
now what he has worked to put together over the past five years, which is the islet cell auto transplantation program. So Mike, thank you very much for being here and we look forward to hearing how you're going to help us help our diabetic patients with their chronic illness. Thank you so much, Dr. Roman and Dr. Kruger. It's a great opportunity to be able to talk to you guys about the islet transplant program. This never would have happened. This was not part of my plan when I came here. It wouldn't have ever occurred if I wasn't approached by multiple different GI doctors asking me if I could do this. They knew I trained in how to do this procedure. And so I said, sure, we'll try to figure out how to make it happen. I ran into uh, Stu Williams over at the Cardiovascular Innovation Institute that was doing islet transplant research, had a clean room. So we started getting together trying to figure out how to make it happen. We got funding from the Jewish Heritage Fund for Excellence that partially funded the recruitment of the most experienced islet transplant team in the world from Minnesota under Dr. Bala, who's here. And then we never would have been as successful as we've been if it weren't for Dr. Moxie Goodenum, Dr. Chris Achami, as far as taking meticulous care of these patients to ensure that the islets actually engraft and do well. So it's been a very coordinated effort between multiple different disciplines. And what I'm gonna to present today is actually work from four different departments within the School of Medicine. This is not just a surgery program, not just a medicine program, but we have other departments as well. And what's particularly interesting is that we have the opportunity to be able to hopefully remotely process islets, engineer the islets so we can send them back to the centers that wanna do this um, of better quality and um, more successful with engraftment than anywhere else in the world, really. So the last part of it is a bit about research and what possibilities are. I've asked the people that have actually done the work to come here because I'm presenting things that I've not done and I'd rather them talk about it if you guys have questions. And I'm gonna try to get through it so that we have plenty of time for questions at the end. So this has also been a good collaboration between Kentucky One Health, U of L Physicians, and uh, the School of Medicine. The lab where we actually do the islet isolations uses the Cardiovascular Innovation Institute, which is already a collaboration between Jewish Hospital and U of L. U of L Physician obviously provides the manpower as far as the physicians that help care for these patients. And it's a good example of how the three different organizations work together very well to do something that nobody in our region is doing. Disclosures, our main financial disclosures is that the Jewish Heritage Fund for Excellence really kind of got this going as far as the funding, but U of L has chipped in and <coughs> really provided a lot of support as well. We also have programmatic and salary support from the NIH and um, any off-label use of products are described as off-label, but there's not a whole lot of that in here. So as far as a patient to uh, distill the sort of issues we're dealing with, uh, one of the patients that we've done already was a 50-year-old male chronic pancreatitis for seven years on doses of narcotics that would kill probably most of the people in this room or at least severely disable us. Very small pancreatic graft on EUS and ERCT, so there's no real interventional strategy that could uh, be expected to work for him. He's already, um, he's very malnourished, his BMI is 23, but that probably underrepresents the degree of malnutrition that he has. He requires prion, so he already has pancreatic exocrine failure. He's not diabetic, so he has preserved endocrine failure, I mean preserved endocrine function. And then he has chronic nausea and vomiting because we have gastroparesis. These are the people that we end up dealing with on a routine basis. It's messy, but we gotta make sure that we do the right thing for them. So it's important to differentiate islet autotransplantation from islet allotransplantation. These are very, two very different things for different purposes, and there's different financial implications for these as well for our program. So islet autotransplantation is performed in the setting of the total pancreatectomy to preserve insulin secretory capacity. Islets are removed from a resected pancreas and then returned to the same patient. There is no immunosuppression. These are the patient's own cells. This is considered medically necessary by the FDA and is therefore reimbursed by commercial carriers. Islet allotransplantation, on the other hand, is performed for type 1 diabetics to restore insulin secretory capacity. So we take islets from the deceased donor pancreas and then transplant them into a different recipient. This requires immunosuppression and is still considered experimental by the FDA and is therefore not reimbursed. However, this is also routinely performed in other nations such as Canada and in Europe. So this is not really far off from being prime time. What I plan on talking about today for islet autotransplantation is first a clinical overview. Uh, we'll talk about chronic pancreatitis briefly, mention Crohn's disease that has a certain relevance to the state of Kentucky, talk about diabetes 3C, and then islet autotransplantation, this is all done at Jewish Hospital. Briefly mention islet allotransplantation because this is all setting us up to be able to do islet allotransplantation in addition to autotransplantation. And then 
also the possibility of remote processing of ILIS. Being in Louisville, close proximity to UPS, there's really only one other town in the country, Memphis, that potentially could do what we're shooting to do, and they don't do ILIS. And then lastly, gastroparesis. Um, people oftentimes ask me why I ended up doing all this gastroparesis stuff, and I'm interested in pancreas transplants and diabetes. But you'll see gastroparesis is a very closely related disease uh, for these patients. Research overview. Our goal is to transplant ILIS to cure type 1 diabetes without immunosuppression. It seems like a lofty goal, but hopefully you can see by the work done by our collaborators at the end that this is a very achievable goal at UofL. Uh, we have Dr. Bala who came down from Minnesota. His expertise is maximizing islet yields in pancreases, and also he's starting to engineer the islets more and more. Uh, Dr. Stu Williams optimizes islet engraftment and uses bioprinters to actually deliver the islets in a different way to have them more successfully engraft. And then Dr. Sherwan, his uh, goal is to protect the transplanted islets from rejection without systemic immunosuppression. So chronic pancreatitis is long-standing inflammation of the pancreas due to alcohol and tobacco use, gallstones, or a genetic predisposition. It's characterized by pain with frequent narcotic dependency, nausea, and vomiting. It irreversibly alters structure and function of the pancreas. So you get endocrine failure, type 3C diabetes, and you get exocrine failure with malabsorption requiring prion or some other generic form of the drug. I guess I should not use uh, the brand names. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a surgeon. I only know so many names of drugs. Um, so there are multiple interventions only ameliorate the symptoms. You never actually get rid of the parenchymal disease. There's 56,000 hospitalizations per year in the United States for chronic pancreatitis. You guys know these people. They're in the hospital over and over and over again. It's miserable for them. It's difficult for the hospital and healthcare system to take, take care of. The relative risk of pancreatic cancer is very high at 13.5. And the total pancreatectomy is really the only cure. You take out somebody's pancreas and it can be very difficult. Most physicians think, and they tell their patients, that removing the pancreas is incompatible with life. Here we can show that that's actually no longer true. Oops, I hit the wrong button. So just here's an example of what a CAT scan may look for, very end-stage chronic pancreatitis, diffuse calcific pancreatitis. You can see all along here, this is calcium deposits in the pancreas. We barely, barely rarely see this degree of pancreatitis. It's usually more subtle, and it can get challenging to figure out if they truly have pancreatitis or they have something else such as gastroparesis or some other confounding diagnosis. Sloan's disease, very interesting, um, is characterized by recurrent episodes of acute pancreatitis in the first two decades of life. 50% of these progress to chronic pancreatitis, whereas only 10% progress to chronic pancreatitis due to other reasons. The Sloan family is from Southern Pike County, Kentucky, and they um, <coughs> were able to look at the large pedigree of this family and determine that it was passed down in an autosomal dominant fashion, and this was published in 1972. This gained national attention in the 1989, so early 90s as well, when the Wall Street Journal quoted Kevin Sloan, a teenager from Elkhorn City, Kentucky, diagnosed with hereditary chronic pancreatitis, saying, you don't realize how many food commercials are on TV until you can't eat. So after Kevin was admitted to the University of Kentucky with a flair, Dr. Larry Gates, who was there, paired up with Dr. David Whitcomb from the University of Pittsburgh, and Dr. Charles Ulrich from the University of Cincinnati to study the Sloan family. They, um, Kevin's father, I think Bobby Sloan, got the family together on the border of eastern Kentucky and western Virginia on Memorial Day one year to get blood samples from 90 different relatives. And by using these blood samples, they were able to map the genes for hereditary pancreatitis to the long arm of chromosome 7. So this mutation in PRFS1 that was identified results in succinogen autoactivation. And this was published in Nature Genetics in 1997. The majority of all hereditary pancreatitis in the United States can be traced to this Eastern Kentucky family. The costs to Kentucky per year are very high. If you look at the ICD-9 code for chronic pancreatitis, which is 577.1, you can identify, at least in 2013, that over 3,000 outpatient discharges were accounted for this disease and 3,000 inpatient admissions. Each inpatient admission is about $33,000. So if you add this all up, it ends up being $104 million. If you extrapolate this to include the U.S. 56,000 admissions, we get $1.9 trillion spent on chronic pancreatitis per year by the healthcare system. And then if we just look at the distribution of these cases of chronic pancreatitis, we'll see that most of them are in Louisville, Owensboro, and E-Town. We don't have anything mapping out to eastern Kentucky, even though the genetic mutation was mapped out there. So what does that mean? We don't really know. Maybe people in eastern Kentucky aren't getting the same access to health care as the rest of the state. That wouldn't be too surprising. 
So it dies of the type 3C. Uh, this is pancreatogenic diabetes due to chronic pancreatic inflammation or total pancreatectomy. It only represents about 5 to 10 percent of diabetics, but 85 percent of these cases are due to chronic pancreatitis. It can coexist with type 2 diabetes, so it can be a bit confusing to sort out, and it is observed in the majority of patients with chronic pancreatitis, particularly given enough years of chronic pancreatitis. In contrast to type 1, where you have beta cell loss, there is also loss of glucagon and pancreatic polypeptides, leading to a much more brittle, difficult to control diabetes. So this is the most important slide for me when I'm talking to patients about potentially taking their pancreas out, is that if they don't have this operation and they continue to let the chronic pancreatitis proceed, they'll eventually become diabetic. So at 10 years, 50% of patients with chronic pancreatitis are diabetic, 80% at 20 years. You don't necessarily avoid diabetes by avoiding treatment. So this is just a picture of sort of how it all works. It's not exactly how it works, but it kind of breaks it down. So you got a pancreas, you take it out, you send it over to the CII, Dr. Ball and his team isolate the islets here, and then we infuse them back into the portal vein in the operating room. We actually don't put it through here. We actually have to put it through here because we have the abdomen open and we can infuse it. But nonetheless, it's the same concept. And we put it in the portal vein because the liver is the only organ that can really take the hit and recover. So you get liver injury, liver recovers, works out well. It's not necessarily the ideal environment for islets because it's relatively hypoxic. And also when you embolize the islets of the fucking liver, you're embolizing, you're creating ischemic insult. So the islets are trying to engraft in a hypoxic environment where this tissue factor elaborate and complement fixation and then a cascade of thrombosis. So we've got to figure out a better way to do it. So that's how we do it currently. It cures pancreatitis in all patients because the pancreas is gone. It prevents diabetes in many, and there's no immunosuppression needed. So this is the seminal work that brought this out to the world from the University of Minnesota. You can see one of the authors here is our very own Dr. David Dunn. Uh, I believe he was chairman at this time. The real first pioneer that pushed this was Dr. Sutherland. Dr. Sutherland was working with Dr. Dunn to make this happen. And there's a bunch of other famous names in transplantation, such as John Nagarian. So this is really done um, very pioneering, pioneering work. You wonder if it's even something we could be doing these days because it was so radical at the time. And then the first experience with 40-some patients was published back in 1995, but the first patient was in the 1970s. So it was first done in 1977 at the University of Minnesota. It was proof of concept for aloe transplantation. This was really their interest. They wanted to fix type 1 diabetes by transplanting islets in patients. It was unclear whether or not their prior failures with islet allo transplantation were technical or immunologic. So they wanted to remove the immunologic aspect of it and just focus on the technical to figure out if this could be overcome. So they did a patient back then, and uh, the patient remained pain-free and insulin-independent for the rest of her life. They first presented their results with 10 patients to the American Surgical Congress in 1980, and then in this paper in 1995, the first 48 patients. Patients have done very well. They've continued it over since the 1970s and it was a routine part of my transplant training. Results improved as islet, as islet yield per pancreas has improved, which led them to conclude, which we still say today, is that islet yield is the main determinant of success. We'd like to change that to some degree in the sense that we'd like to be able to engineer the islets to make them more successful with engraftment, so maybe the pure number is not necessarily the only factor. So in the islet evaluation, we have the endocrine and the GI evaluation. They're kind of the most key. Uh, for the endocrine evaluation, Dr. Mokshagunam and Dr. Krishnasamy have really taken this by the horns. Um, in fact, Dr. Mokshagunam was just named the medical director of this program. And so he's organizing all these different things and helping us to figure out how to expand this to islet allo transplantation. So that they perform mixed meal tolerance tests to assess islet function, check A1C, and then some um, other testing. The GI doctor, we oftentimes need help confirming the diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis. These are really their patients anyways, and they're sending them to us because they've done everything they can to possibly fix this problem, and they're unable to, and so this is the last stage. It's also important to exclude other causes. Nausea, vomiting, and pain sounds just like gastroparesis. Oftentimes, there's coexisting gastroparesis. We will, we'll have patients that have clear pancreatitis, and they have clear gastroparesis. What are we trying to tackle first? What's the best thing for the patient? It can be a bit difficult to sort out since we have the capability of doing temporary gastric stimulation here and making that better, it makes it a bit easier for us to sort out, are we going to address the chronic pancreatitis or are we going to address the gastroparesis? And then from the surgery standpoint, it's fairly straightforward. We've got to make sure that we can do the operation and not hurt the patient. SMV thrombosis is actually something that's a bit of a problem for these very long-standing diabetics. 
um, just due to distortion of the gland, we can get stricture of the SMV. They form collaterals around the pancreas that we would need to divide to take the pancreas out. We divide the collaterals, the bowel fails, the liver fails. It's a problem. So we still have some people that we really can't take care of. Also, they oftentimes have multiple prior pancreatic surgeries, particularly drainage operations end up being problematic because if they had a Pusso and the duct is violated, it makes it harder to get the islets out of the pancreas because you can't infuse the enzymes into the pancreatic duct. And also, don't operate during flares. This is something that any of us that operate on the pancreas know. We may be pushed to do it. The patients are miserable. They want their pancreas out. But the last thing you want to do is operate during a flare. These have a, patients have a pro-inflammatory state. You operate on them, they clot off everything, they get massive PEs, it's a disaster. And, uh, we have our transplant psychologists evaluate the patient for untreated mental illness or substance abuse, somatization, lingering. Um, it can be very difficult to sort out um, if the patients would benefit from this. And oftentimes they're very psychologically deranged from having chronic pain. And so we try to set them up for success by having them go through multiple different uh, pathways in order to better prepare them to undergo the operation. And then we're also working with palliative care to set expectations for control of pain and anxiety afterwards. This is really one of the most challenging things afterwards. We don't have great solutions for a lot of these patients and pain control can be very difficult. This is the first um, islet transplant we've done here at uh, Jewish Hospital, the first one done in Kentucky. This is where we're taking out the pancreas and then we bag it up just like we would any other organ that we're shipping out for transplant. It gets sent over to the CII where Dr. Bala and his team digest all the peripancreatic tissue, so you're just left with the functional cells. They put it in this recording chamber thing that helps separate the islets from the extern tissue. And then we end up with a bag of islets that we can infuse back to the patient. The whole tissue processing takes about four to five hours. Uh, there's multiple different things that they need to do to juggle back and forth depending upon what pancreas it is. And this is really the hardest part of the entire procedure is getting islets out of very fibrotic disease pancreas. It's a bit different when you're taking a fatty pancreas from a deceased donor, it's more straightforward to get the islets out, but from these pancreases, it's very difficult, which is why it made it much easier for us to get this, off, this program off the ground, have good outcomes by bringing Dr. Ball and his team down here. And then he brings it back. Here he is right here, holding it up and infusing it through a catheter that we cannulate a branch of the portal vein, infuse them throughout the liver. We have to check portal pressures every so often because we'll go from a portal pressure of zero up to a portal pressure of 30 because you get thrombosis, you get uh, portal pressures going up. And so we'll have to stop, take a break, let the pressures go down, and then um, try to get as many in as we can. If we can't get them in before the rest in the peritoneal cavity. And that, interestingly, actually may have good results. Um, there's some recent data showing that um, the glucagon response is a bit better if you put islets in the peritoneal cavity or an extra hepatic site compared with the hepatic site. So we're still not totally sure where it is. Um, best for them to go. We've got some sort of thing flying around. <laughs> Watch out, it's big. So the perioperative man management, we have to heparinize the patient. So you get this big giant operation, you get portal vein, portal hypertension, and then you put on a heparin. And this is kind of a setup for disaster, right? So you gotta make sure you do an operation where they're not gonna bleed later on. You also wanna make sure they don't clot off their portal vein. That's another disaster you don't wanna deal with. And so we have to heparinize the patient while they're in the hospital. We don't necessarily send them home on heparin, but we have to do either low dose minoxaparin or heparin infusion. Here we just do a low dose minoxaparin. That's not quite therapeutic, not quite prophylactic. Uh, we also put a G-tube in so they can vent out of here. They have delayed gastric empties for quite some time, but we really need to get them um, fed soon because they're on an insulin drip. We can't get them off an insulin drip until they're at goal rate for tube feed. So we put a J-tube in as well so they can vent via the G-tube, they can feed via the, vent via the G-tube, vent, feed via the J-tube, and then by post-op day two, we're hopefully having them on goal rate for tube feed so we can get them off the insulin fusion, get them out of the ICU and work towards getting them home. Pain management really ends up being the thing that keeps them here for quite some time. So we'll send the patients home about a week afterwards. They won't necessarily be eating. They'll start doing that at home as food starts looking good. So from an endocrine standpoint, all these patients are discharged on insulin. And we need to maintain very tight glycemic control because with hyperglycemia, the islets, um, are damaged. And so we need the blood sugars between about 80 to 120. And then Dr. Moxigoma or Dr. Chris Ashamu will wean them off insulin with their fasting or female blood sugars are 80 to 120. Their two hour postprandial blood sugars less than 180 and they can still maintain an A1C of 6.5. If you get them off insulin and their A1C is eight, you've not really done any good. So then we assess islet function with a mixed meal tolerance test at three, six, 12 months and then yearly thereafter. From a surgery standpoint, we'll look for hepatic abscesses. So we take these islets out of a 
pancreas that's oftentimes colonized with a whole lot of bacteria. So 75% of the time, the islets are actually colonized. Um, and then we infuse them in the liver. So we have to keep them on antibiotics to check their cultures. If their cultures end up being positive, we have to maintain antibiotics a bit longer. The hepatic abscess then isn't really something that's a real problem. It's just something we have to account for when we're actually treating the patient. Uh, we have to watch for portal vein thrombosis. So if we start getting a bunch of ascites afterwards, we have to ultrasound the liver and make sure that the portal vein's not out. And then we have to look for marginal ulcer ulcerations. So when we redo the uh, GI anastomosis, we have um, highly acidic um, succus going by the J genome at the anastomosis that's not accustomed to seeing this. So all these patients really need uh, proton pump inhibitors for life to prevent marginal ulceration, but it can still happen. And then we remove the G and J tubes when they no longer need them, usually about a month afterwards. Um, our GI colleagues manage their intestinal malabsorption with enzyme replacement. And then we also have to watch for hepatic steatosis. When you get localized production of insulin within the liver, the liver's become steatotic around those islets. So we'll get some people, for example, when I first got down here, I was asked to see a patient in our transplant clinic who um, got an islet transplant. Actually, when I was a fellow, I didn't do it, but she, it was at the same time I was there. Um, she was 16 when she had it done. Excellent um, islet function, but she had a profoundly steatotic liver. We biopsied her 95% steatosis. So then we had her see Dr. Uh, Marsano, put her on vitamin E, and was considering putting her on Trental. And this can be something that we have to look out for as well. So we can't just do this and then let the patients um, go off on their merry way without follow-up by us. Palliative care, uh, very challenging. Uh, have I said that enough today? Yes. Very challenging. We have to address both pain and anxiety. These are people that really are having a hard time getting through day by day without doing a big, huge operation on them, making them newly diabetic, and then having them come back and see you frequently, right? Very difficult. And then we really try not to wean their narcotics until they're cleared by our endocrinologists. We want them to be able to focus on their tight glycemic control because we want the outs to survive. So we're not looking to wean people off narcotics until three, six months later. And we're not really looking to assess whether or not we're, we can get them off narcotics until we're a full year out. It can take time. So the expected outcomes, from the, we have both the uh, pancreatectomy aspect of the operation, which is really the point of doing, um, the point of the whole thing is to get their pancreas out to cure them of pancreatitis. I would auto transplant is just to make the operation more safe, okay? So for the total pancreatectomy, none of them get recurrent pancreatitis because none of them have a pancreas. They get improvement in pain about 90% of patients. Some people you just can't get off narcotics, but about three quarters of patients you can still get off narcotics. And then they're all gonna have intestinal malabsorption. So it's important to talk about this uh, when we're, con when we're um, discussing the operation with them. And then we also need to talk about the possibility of diabetes. So we evaluate them, determine if they have good islet function. And then um, we really define functioning islets or successfully engrafted islets as those with C-peptide at greater than 0.3. So the benchmark at really established by University of Minnesota and also at Cincinnati from a few years back when they were doing it, is that about 70% of patients should have islet function. The insulin independence is about 30% of patients. So you may have people that are C-peptide positive but still require a single dose of insulin per day that's still considered a success. And therefore, the patients must be willing to trade chronic pancreatitis for diabetes. And only they can decide whether or not this is really the operation for them. I don't push anybody to have the operation. Only they know if their life is so bad to warrant going through all this. And the main determinant of success still remains islet yield. So just looking at some of the results that we have, um, this is the six patients we've done so far. And we look at C-peptide pre-op and then fasting C-peptide pre-op, and then the islet number here on the y-axis. And we can see that peak C-peptide actually predicts islet yield fairly well, and fasting C-peptide also predicts it very well. If we're comparing our results to published results from Minnesota, you can see that our correlation coefficient is very similar for peak C-peptide and a little higher for the fasting C-peptide. Our numbers are small, so we'll have to see how this evolves time, over time. But so far, we're doing quite well. And then if you look at how the patients actually did afterwards, we're also doing quite well. We've done six patients so far over the past eight months. One was diabetic that had good insulin secretory capacity, so we still did the islet transplant on her. This is a well-accepted reason for doing it. Length of stay uh, has been a median of seven days. We've had a couple outliers. Uh, two patients are off narcotics. Um, at least we may have uh, three or four off narcotics uh, intermittently. All have functioning islets at the moment. We have one patient, this last one we did, is still too early really to assess islet function, but all the ones are far enough out to assess islet function have functioning islets. Two patients are insulin independent. Our diabetic patient is on less insulin than she was prior to the operation, and three patients are still weaning insulin. 
So, so far, so good. Long-term islet function is, uh, should be fairly stable over time. If you look at insulin requirements, you can see that initially um, uh, pre-op, it's going to be low, right, because they're not diabetic. And then post-op, insulin requirements are very stable over time. And if you look at C-peptide, the sig peptide is, you know, normal pre-op. It drops down, but then it's maintained over time, and this is 10 years out. So islet allotransplantation indicated for lean type 1 diabetics with hypoglycemic unawareness. Totally different patient population, totally different operations, totally different circumstances. As I mentioned before, it's still considered experimental by the FDA and is therefore not reimbursed by commercial payers, so it can only be done in the setting of trials. There was a clinical trial that uh, was going on funded by the NIH. They're collecting the results to figure out what the outcomes are, to figure out if the FDA will change how it considers islet allotransplantation. It's routinely performed in Canada and Europe and is uh, paid for. Just this month in diabetes care, the French Swiss group reported their results, um, and they have achieved 75% insulin independence. It's only a mean of about uh, 29 months. However, this is a good starting point. And 60% of these patients have five-year graft survival. Now, you've got to be careful looking at graft survival for islets because your uh, outcome measure is different than it is for pancreas transplant. So when we do a pancreas transplant, a pancreas transplant is considered fail if you return to insulin. An islet transplant is considered fail if you get hypoglycemic unawareness or your A1C goes over 7.0. So it can still be a functioning islet if you're on insulin and you don't have hypoglycemic unawareness and you don't have an A1C of greater than 7.0. So it ends up being the operation we do it for different reasons. The islet transplant is really where it probably will fit in is for our diabetics that are too sick to get a whole organ pancreas transplant at least as we get this going, and to have profound hypoglycemic unawareness, which is really where diabetes, rather than just being a chronic disease, it ends up being a daily life-threatening disease. And so islet transplant kind of rescues them from that very unstable state with their hypoglycemic unawareness. And so we expect that the FDA may roll as early as April of 2016 that this procedure is medically necessary like islet autotransplantation. And now that we're doing islet autotransplantation, we should be well poised to actually start delivering islet allotransplantation to our patients. And then our U of L team is very experienced with islet allotransplantation because they were part of the trial that was doing this, doing this at Minnesota. Uh, Dr. Bottom's team has done over 500 isolations for patients. Um, so tons of experience there. Remote processing of islets. So we're trying to figure out how we can actually make this bigger than just our local area and impact more patients. And the main barriers to islet transplantation is establishing a facility that has DCT or DMT capabilities. That's good tissue practices, good medical practices. Um, GTT is required for islet autotransplantation. GMT is required for islet allotransplantation because allo islets you have to incubate for 48 hours to make sure that they don't have any bacteria because you're going to transplant them into an immunosuppressed host. You also need personnel trained in isolation. You can't just build a facility and expect to get islets out of pancreas. You have to have people that know how to do it, and there just aren't that many, so it makes it difficult. And it's a huge investment by a program to establish an ILO lab capable of doing this. So what's been done at some other places and has been reported in the literature is where you do the operation and the ILO isolation at different um, sites. So Dartmouth has worked with Mass General Hospital, Cleveland Clinic with the University of Pittsburgh, and UCLA with UCSF. But this has all been for ground transportation. We've not had air transportation for any of these. Just the time is thought maybe to be too long. But this was a good way to get it going and to show that, yeah, we can do this safely and the patients do fine. So this is also what should be noted is that the people doing allo transplantation are proposing that when we go to allo transplantation, we're going to be remotely processing islets. We're not going to have every center establish their own islet lab. You know, pancreases would get sent to the islet lab. They get processed and they get shipped out to the center that wants to do it. So we're hoping to be able to be one of these regional centers. We have the unique capability of being closely aligned with UPS. Um, we've actually been talking with them about um, how they can help us with this. It's been very timely because CODA, the Kentucky Organ Donor Affiliates, has started working with UPS to try to get them to ship out kidneys. And they've found that there's a dramatic, oftentimes 50% reduction in the transit time for the organs by working with UPS. They've not started shipping this out, but they hope to be shipping the first kidney next month. And this will then set us up to be able to do islets hopefully the first quarter of next year. This is just a talking stage, but this is something that we should be able to do. UPS is a bit conflicted in the sense that they don't ship organs for transplant. However, they ship tissues. 
And so they just need to decide whether or not they can actually work with human organ. But logistically, it makes more sense to work with GPS. The other alternative is to do what Coda normally does, which is work with commercial carriers. So you send out an organ that sits on a tarmac, waits for a commercial flight to take off, and then it sits at the other receiving site until a courier picks it up. UPS actually has a person follow the organ the whole way. It's the first thing to come off the plane, and it gets sent to a facility in a very timely fashion. They have a special group that does this, where oftentimes the cargo of the plane is worth more than the actual plane itself. So um, we want to take advantage of the fact that we have the most experienced islet isolation team in the world. We want to remotely process the ALO islets because by doing this, we have greater volumes and make it easier for us to adopt an ALO program here at U of L as well. And it'll also help fund islet lab growth, um, increase access to islet for research, and um, hopefully we can expand this throughout the entire country rather than just the close. Uh, centers that are close to us. We'd like to support centers that are farther away. If the patients are close by, we'd rather them come to us to get treatment because, as you can see, this can also be very complicated care for the patient. Gastroparesis. Gastroparesis is a huge problem. Uh, it's failure of the stomach to empty normally. You guys all know this, I suspect, by now. Uh, we all deal with these patients, but they're very difficult. Same symptoms as chronic pancreatitis, nausea, vomiting, and pain. We diagnosed it with a nuclear medicine gastric imaging study. And the gastroparesis and the chronic pancreatitis can coexist. Oftentimes, they look identical. Patients have both. What do you do with these people? By doing a trial of temporary gastric stimulation, like I mentioned before, if you make the gastroparesis better and go away, then you see what you're left over with. And if a lot of their pain that they still have is pancreatitis, then you go down that road. If you make them a whole lot better with a trial of temporary gastric stimulation, then you go down that road. Putting a pacer gastric stimulator in somebody is less risky than taking out their whole pancreas and doing an islet transplant. And then we have some people where we go down the pathway, we do a gastric stimulator on them, and then down the road they still need a pancreatectomy. One of our patients actually had a stimulator done by me uh, a year ago, still had pancreatitis issues, and she was um, our fifth one that we've done. So uh, gastroelectrical stimulation is often the only effective treatment, and then also it can be useful for the people having this operation. They may develop post-surgical gastroparesis, so we may need to do a gastric stimulator on them afterwards. So we really are well poised to approach these patients in a more comprehensive manner. This is the happiest gastroparesis patient I've ever seen. And I see a lot of gastroparesis patients. So um, most of them are very chronically ill, miserable, unhappy. With the temporary, I think this is the reason why Dr. Abel gave me this picture. With the temporary, they're, they're happy, right? So when patients see me, they want the operation done like a week ago. They don't want to wait because their lives are completely changed. It's profound how different these people get afterwards. If they are responders to the stimulator, their lives are changed. It's amazing. So... Um, the FSP has tested the proximal and distal stomach, and um, we put the leads in the OR where they responded best, and then without the temp. So if we do it in this fashion, where we do the trial of temporary stimulation first, and then put in the permanent stimulator, 90% of these patients respond. They do very well. Whereas if you're at other programs that don't do the temporary gastric stimulation, they're just putting in all comers, it's about 50-50 whether or not they're gonna respond to this permanent stimulator. And also, here, you just put it 10 centimeters proximal to the pylorus, Whereas if we do the trial of temporary stimulation, then they actually need the stimulator in the proximal stomach rather than the distal stomach. So we have a much more um, methodical approach to how we treat these patients. And then 90% of the temporary stimulators in the world are done by Drs. Abel and Dr. Stocker at U.S. hospitals. So truly unique opportunity for these patients. And then this is just a picture of one of the patients we did. His operation ends up being fairly um, straightforward. We do a small two and a half centimeter incision in the midline. This is an on -view pain pump to help control their pain, limit their narcotic needs. They have a transverse skin incision where the generator sits here. We send them home on post-op day one. By making the incision smaller, putting the on -view pain pump, our standard length of stay is now one day for these chronically ill patients that are doing very poorly. We have the world's largest program doing about 300 per year. The next biggest program does less than 100 per year. Um, outcomes are very good. They get adjusted by Dr. Stocker, Dr. Abel, and their teams monthly for three to six months until they're as good as they were with the temporary, hopefully. And then generator replacements, we hope, will be every five to seven years. Of interest for these patients, when I'm operating to do a pancreatectomy on them, is 90% have a hypercoagulable state. So we embolize the islets into the liver. We're worried about thrombosis, and they might have a hypercoagulable state. It's a bad setup, so we have to be very careful. Our one patient where we had portal vein thrombosis so far is a patient that had a gastric stimulator. So now we have to be much more cognizant of these patients when we're actually doing bigger operations on them. So for what we do, this is really a very integrated thing. And people ask, why do you do gastroparesis stuff? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? Everything I do is basically the same patient population. 
So I have diabetics that I'm looking to treat with pancreas transplant and now hopefully in the future islet transplant. We have people with chronic pancreatitis that may have coexisting diabetes or we might be trying to prevent diabetes by doing islet allo transplant. Then we have chronic pancreatitis patients that have this coexisting gastroparesis. So what are we tackling first? And then obviously you have gastroparesis patients that are a huge portion of them are diabetic. And so this is a very tightly related group of people and we have unique opportunities to care for them in multiple different ways. So then to go, I want to make sure we have some time for questions at the end and just to go through the outlet research at UofL. Um, and we have the people here doing the work so they can answer some of the questions. Just to let you know kind of where we're hoping to go is that as I said before, we're hoping to transplant islet to cure type 1 diabetes without immunosuppression. Dr. Bala is looking to get the most number of islets out of the pancreas because as we've already said, the more islets you get out, the more likely they are to be free of diabetes afterwards. We want to optimize delivery of islets to the patient by engineering them and then protect the islets by engineering them further by um, protecting them from rejection without systemic immunosuppression with Dr. Shawan. So as far as Dr. Bala's work, this is some pictures of islets that are isolated from pancreases. They're naked. There's nothing coming off them, right? So there's no capillaries. So he's been able to modify the isolation procedure where you're actually getting tufts of capillaries coming off the islet. So this is one coming off here, we think, some sort of structure. And then you can see, you can actually get multiple different cellular sprouts coming all off the islet in multiple different directions. And then uh, under fluorescent scan, you can see it more clearly. But then we had to he had to figure out whether or not these are really endothelial cells or not. So we stain them for endothelial cells. And you can see the green staining are the endothelial cells. So these are the capillaries. And then the blue would be the islets. So nobody's done this before. This is a way of engineering the islets to make them more successfully engraft. We need more time, or he needs more time to sort out if this is actually impacting them after transplantation, but it seems logical. So very promising. And then this is another approach where you actually put the islets in a, st a stromal vascular fraction um, environment, and then they can grow the capillaries there as well. So uh, Dr. Williams is not here. I think he uh, could not make it, but he is really <coughs> working towards establishing the role we can use, uh, the role of the stromal vascular fraction using a bioprinter. So the concept what we have here is you start with the patient, you take out their pancreas. You take off the fat, you go this direction, you take the pancreatic tissue, you go this direction. So the fat, you digest it, you get out the stromal vascular fraction, and then you put it in the bioprinter. You take <coughs> the pancreas with the islets, you put it in the reporting chamber, digest the pancreas, get out the islets, separate it from the surrounding tissue, so you get purified islets and put it in the printer with the stromal vascular fraction cells to create these spheroids that are then going back to the patient. This is a picture of the bioprinter at the CII. You can see here, we're actually printing islets. And an, this, I believe, is an alginate construct. And then this is one, this is a spheroid with a number of islets in it. So this is stuff we're doing right now. And this is a, another picture <coughs> that you can see better the islets throughout this alginate construct. And then we also can do this in a way that's not very time consuming, right? We don't want the patient sitting there in the operating room waiting on these for days. They can't do it. And we'd rather not subject them to two operations. So how quick can we do this? And there's other work we're doing with um, an SDIR grant where we're working with this company TechShot to do this magnetic islet purification. But the way it potentially goes, you get the pancreas out, you digest the fat, you get the stromal vascular fraction cells with the bioprinter, you get the pancreas. And then here what we can do to save time is we actually embolize uh, magnetic beads into the islets. So they go selectively in the islets and use a magnetic field to pull the islets out to more rapidly get your islets out and then put them together to print the spheroids so that in four hours we're ready to implant the uh, spheroids back into the patient. And then <coughs> the, this is just different pictures of the spheroids, but the main thing to see is that they do function. I apologize, it's a bit small, but this is insulin production by a naked islet here. And you can see islet spheroids are similar and then islets with the stromal vascular fraction cells in spheroid formation also function. And then they also respond to <coughs> glucose stimulated, they also produce um, stimulated insulin production in response to glucose. You can see uh, baseline and then stimulated for naked islets, baseline and stimulated for the spheroids, and then baseline and stimulated for the spheroids and the vascular, uh, stromal vascular fraction cells. And then we can also uh, use electrospun spun fibers to create scaffolding where we impregnate the islets into the scaffolding. We can alternatively use a biologic device where we actually create a sandwich between the apose uh, derived stromal vascular fraction cells and the islets to implant them and potentially avoid the liver. So not have to deal with portal vein thrombosis, not have to deal with heparinization. 
Dr. Sherwan is really where we're getting into the aloe uh, transplantation field. And, or he's been in it for a long time. I shouldn't say we're just getting into it. Um, he's the world's expert in this. And we use technologies where you use recombinant proteins uh, with robust immunomodulatory activity to display them on the surface of the cells so that you don't need to systemically treat a patient. You just locally treat the cells you're transplanting to make it less recognizable by the immune system. And you take biologic membranes, you biotinylate them, you uh, conjugate streptavidin um, to the proteins you want um, to deliver, and then you deliver them so they decorate the surface. So fast ligand is what he's looking at. So fast ligand could be an immunomodulatory protein to induce tolerance for islet aloe transplantation. And so this just shows that you know they're able to decorate the surface with this fast ligand, and that the outcomes are spectacular in the sense that if you look at these uh, treated cells, there's 100% survival at 500 days, whereas the control groups rapidly lose islet function. And then can this be used for uh, genogenetic islets? And this is the same thing. They're able to successfully, um, this time rather than mice, they're looking at rats, able to label the rat islets. And then they take the rat islets that are engineered and transplant them into mice. So somewhat related animals, however, cross species and find that the function over time is stable with no loss compared to rapid loss with their controls. And then looking at pig islets. So this is a much bigger Im immunologic barrier is going from pig uh, to mice. And here they have successfully labeled the pig islets. And then results aren't quite as good, not 100%, but this is a much bigger barrier. And this is where they are either delivered to the intraportal system, which they're looking at because that's sort of what we do clinically, right? It is what we do clinically. Or in the subrenal capsule, and this results um, better than the portal, but both these are a heck of a lot better than the controls. So these are all the different people that were key. It took me, uh, it takes me about 15 minutes to go through this slide and explain everything. So I'm just gonna put it up there. There's a ton of different people that were involved with making this thing work. Um, this is not one person I'm up, up here talking, but there was a ton of different people that were all critical to make this happen, um, multiple different organizations. And so thanks for the opportunity to present our work. Thank you so much. That was, that was outstanding. So I didn't know any of this before. And, that, and, and that's, that's important. And so I'm glad that we came to talk to you. There are several concepts today that I want our, our attendees at least to, uh, to, to recognize. That one is the clinician scientist, somebody who does clinical work, patient oriented work, but is also involved in investigation. Number two, the idea that big science and big changes that are in can only be done through a tremendous team approach and multidisciplinary approach because a lot of people from surgery, endocrinology, and so forth. And then the third is the question for you. <clears throat> it seems like uh, the main issues are caused by the infusion of the, of the ice. In other words, they cause potentially thrombosis, uh, inflammation, hepatic stenosis. What is in the efficient auto transplantation? What's in this mixture that well, we figured, promotes so many changes? Well, we figured there's tissue factor. So you get elaboration of tissue factor, and then you're going to get comp complement activation to go down that whole cascade. So if there's a way to block the whole complement cascade that you induce by sending the islets in there, then it would be very useful. So the islet cells have produced tissue factor by themselves? Mm -hmm. okay. Question. Let's start here. No, but it's not, um, this doesn't fix all their problems, right? So um, these patients, I wish I could say our 30-day readmission rate was zero, but we've had one or about two people that have come back within 30 days, a lot of them pain control issues, and it takes a long time for them to get over this whole operation. We don't have, um, it's a small field, long-term outcomes are really focused on the endocrine function, not so much the quality of life, and so all we can really say is that by a year, um, looking at all the different studies, by a year, um, people's quality of life is better, their narcotic dependency is less, and they're more likely to be pain-free. But, you know, we don't fix all their problems. I mean, they have multiple problems still.
it's very difficult. So a lot of our patients that come forward, we can't proceed with because our transplant psychologists are like, there's no way you can safely do an operation on a person like this. So they, um, if they, they're not drinking, sometimes they're not drinking because they're in and out of the hospital and they don't have time to drink. Um, same thing we see for liver transplants. So I think from our standpoint, we've just adopted the same things that we've been doing for all our other transplant patients where substance abuse is a huge problem. And this is something that we're trying to figure out how to establish resources within Kentucky One Health. Um, there's some local resources we're trying to figure out how to take advantage of. And we hope to be able to iron these things out. We were just uh, recently became officially part of transplant. We just sort of did this thing on our own. Um, and now, just as of a month ago, we're actually part of the transplant program, even on the transplant surgeon. So now we have the infrastructure of the transplant program to closely evaluate these patients. But I have a lot of patients where they, we were referred, we did the evaluation, they're fine from every, every other standpoint, but we can't actually do it yet. And so oftentimes they're given tasks where they have to establish uh, psychiatric care or psychological care. They have to demonstrate that they actually made it to their appointments and they have to do it for a certain period of time, usually six months. So the alcohol is just saying, oh yeah, not drinking for six months, that's not quite enough um, because we want to do this and not totally destroy their lives. Um, and these people, they have almost no reserve. Yeah, the question behind Is it, how are they different by going in the liver? Can I call a friend? <laughs> Dr. Moshe Gunnam, are you here? <laughs> yeah. yeah. All I can really say is the, uh, you know, the glucagon secretion is not as functional in the liver as elsewhere, but can you answer? The, I mean, the alternative is just the peritoneal cavity, where apparently you have more preserved glucagon response. But you put it in the peritoneal cavity after an operation with drains coming out, you're losing islets. And then if you have to re-explore the patient for bleeding or something, you're losing all the islets you put in there. So it's a bit tricky going there, um, which is why I think we need to develop. It's universally accepted within the field that we need to find some place other than the liver to put the islets. What you can do with the aloes, but different than the autos, the autos you have a, only one pancreas to work with and it's diseased. So the aloes, you can use multiple pancreases to get a higher islet number. So if you look at the to total number of islets that are transplanted for an alo transplant, it's like two times or more number of islets that actually go into the person from full donors. But then over time, you know, there's progressive loss, just like there is for kidney transplants or pancreas transplants or livers. You know, we don't totally 
prevent the immune system from attacking the organ. So you keep, get progressive loss of function. Tell me more about the function therapy uh, group of people that's done by Dr. Kilborn and Dr. Myers and Dr. Kilborn. Uh, are those, uh, can you predict based on the severity of diabetes whether it can be improved, how badly that depression could be or even totally or something like that? The reason I bring that up is because this, the people who come to you for the uh, surgery sometimes are really at the end of their rope. Now they've been years at this, so their mental state is and their dysfunctionality is what the symptoms are beginning to be. Are there biomarkers that I could tell this person's condition now is this way and you can't just put a patch on it? Uh, not that I know of as far as the gastric bresis. For the pancreatitis, uh, there's not really so much biomarkers, but the feeling in the field is evolving towards earlier pancreatectomy to get the ILOs out when they're more healthy, so you can get more ILOs out. But for the you know the gastroparesis, it's hard to know. 60% of the gastroparesis is just idiopathic. We don't quite know. Um, and even though diabetes is the number one known cause, it still only represents 25% of patients that are you know, that have this gastroparesis. So it's a very poorly understood population. Um, if they respond to the gastric stimulation early on and then they fail over time, start looking for different autoantibodies. And I feel like Dr. Abel and Dr. Stalker look, uh, are experts in autoimmunity just as much as anybody else where they may need to treat with IVIG to decrease the immune response and make the gastroparesis better. It's complicated. Questions? If not, thank you so much.